Our gospel for this Monday Thursday evening comes from the Gospel of John in the 13th chapter. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash to the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only then, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet but is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I... Your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. So I don't always have a title for my sermons, but if I had a title for this one, it might be Lowered Expectations. You know that old Mad TV skit, right? Lowered Expectations. It's a sketch about a dating site where people set their expectations really, really low and go on dates with people who any normal person wouldn't want to go to dinner with. That's where my mind went as I thought of the kind of people Jesus went to dinner with on Monday Thursday so many years ago. I mean, as you think of Jesus' table and who was sitting there, Jesus had some pretty low standards, didn't he? Lowered expectations. Here we find ourselves on Monday Thursday and we gather together once again in a quiet room for a quiet meal. And we find Jesus with this bunch of bumbling disciples sitting at the table with him. They're all gathered here for Jesus' last meal, and this group of men is quite the crew of misfits. First, there's Peter, one of Jesus' most loyal followers. But this is also the brash, no inhibitions, dumb as a rock Peter. You know him. He's the one whom Jesus tells at this very meal that he's going to deny Jesus three times before the cock crows. And Peter replies that he would never, ever do that. And lo and behold, just a few hours later, what does Peter do? He does just that. Here at this table, we also find all those other disciples who will desert Jesus later tonight when he needs them the most. Look at those two on the opposite end from Jesus. They're the ones who will fall asleep at the Garden of Gethsemane when he asks them to just stay awake and keep watch. Come on, guys. Worst of all, there, just a couple of seats down from Jesus, we find Judas, the betrayer, at this same table. You know him, too. He knows full well what he's going to do. He's about to sell Jesus, his Lord and Savior, to the authorities for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus knows this is coming as well, but here at Jesus' last meal, Judas is right there to receive Jesus' gift of food, of bread, 
and wine with the rest. Jesus has room at his table, even for this one. Jesus really does have some pretty lowered expectations, doesn't he? As if the company he keeps isn't enough, Jesus lowers his standards even further by taking the place of a slave at this meal. This leader and rabbi, their teacher and Lord, gets down on his hands and knees, and he washes the lowest and least respectable part of these disciples' bodies, their feet. Pretty gross, right? I don't know about you, but I don't want people even getting close to my feet for fear of the smell. And these disciples were used to walking around all day in sandals, and the disciples probably haven't taken a shower in a week or two. Yuck, right? No wonder Peter objects when Jesus gets down and takes that low place to wash his feet. Jesus, how could you do this? Don't you have higher standards than this? Lowered expectations. Yet this is how Jesus shows love in action. He goes down to the lowest place with the lowest of the low and feeds them and he washes them clean. And here at his last meal, he says to these bumbling disciples, just as I have done to you, so you must also do for one another. This is how the world will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another, just as I have loved you. I don't know about you, but there are times when I would rather set high expectations. I'd rather rub noses with the people who have it all together. Oh, I know that in the church we're called to love everybody and we're called to accept people just as they are at our table, no matter who they are. But every once in a while, isn't it fun to imagine that you and I could pick and choose the people who sit at our tables? I don't know about you, but wouldn't it be nice to sit with the high society types and see what that was like for a little while? I had this former bishop who talked about how she, along with some other bishops of the ELCA, had this opportunity to go to Washington and schmooze with a few senators. They were going to try to convince them to enact policies that would be just and compassionate for the most vulnerable. And her story goes that she got to sit down at a table and have lunch with some corporate lobbyists who were going to coach this group of bishops on how to get their point across to the senators. These were really smart people, the cream of the crop, who knew how to get things done, and she got to rub noses with them. And she said it was fun to sit around the table with them and hear from these highly educated high society types about the really important things that they were doing. But one speaker shocked her with his story. His name was Scott Klinger, and he was Director of Revenue and Spending Policies for the Center of Effective Government. He had a long and varied career covering various aspects of co corporate social responsibility, and as the co-director of Responsible Wealth, he organized more than 300 millionaires and billionaires in support of a strong federal estate tax. This was a very rich and a very smart and a very powerful guy. But instead of boring us with his importance, she said, he told us about a meal that he attended in a very odd place years ago. Long before programs were put in place to encourage stores and restaurants to give away their unused food, it was all thrown into dumpsters. Scott was a college student at Baltimore and during his college years, he was also one of the very first volunteers for Lutheran Volunteer Corps. His assignment for a class on social justice one day was to literally go dumpster diving. He was asked to crawl into a dumpster and bring out whatever good food he could find and bring it to a local shelter so that people there would have something to eat. It was a real life, real practical assignment that helped get at the root causes of hunger. So, scared to death and a little grossed out doing this task that was pretty beneath him as a well-educated, well-put-together college student, he went. And after pausing in front of the dumpster for a little while and taking a deep breath, he finally dove in. Just as his eyes were adjusting to the dark and as he was trying to plug his nose because of the rancid smell, he heard a rustle and he sensed a large black form was in the dumpster with him. 
Thinking it was a raccoon or a giant rat, he did the most courageous thing he could think of. He screamed. But rather than a large rat or a raccoon, right in front of him was a man sitting in the dumpster, picking over the food. And the man said to him in a gentle voice, don't be afraid, it's okay. There's plenty of food here for both of us. Scott called this episode Christ in the Dumpster, and it profoundly changed his mind about how Christ meets us in this world. He'd gone into that dumpster on an assignment aimed at him trying to serve others and bring food to hungry people who were beneath him. And yet here was a hungry man who was offering him a place at his table. Right then and there, Scott was face to face with Jesus, and he saw how far down Jesus would stoop to feed him and all of us in this world. It is true that Jesus has some pretty low standards. He welcomes all sorts of disreputable, dirty people at his table. He welcomes deniers and deserters and betrayers, and he says to them, come and eat with me. But tonight as we gather around our tables, we find that Jesus does not just stop with those bumbling disciples from long ago. Tonight we are reminded that Jesus goes so low as to meet us where we are. No matter who we are or what we've done, Jesus comes to meet us right here and now. He gathers with us in our little rooms, around our little tables. He breaks bread with us and feeds us with his words of love and grace. And here the servant of the servants says to us, this is my body and here is my blood given up for you and for all people that you might know how deep and how far and how wide for you my love goes. With Jesus here by our side, at his table. We find once again that Jesus' expectations are low enough even to include us. And here at his table, we find there is more than enough for all of us to eat. daylight hours, fragrant flowers bloom. In the olive orchard, emitting sweet perfume. But on this night of malice, kneeling mid the stones, Jesus prays with passion in agony alone. Peaceful walls of roses blossom neath the sun, while near the stony staircase climbing grapevines run. But in the darkest stars, upon this night of hate, pleading with his Father, the Lord awaits his fate. Calling to the weary, 
to come and rest and pray. But underneath the clouds, no moonlight finds the sky, as on this night of treason, the Lord prepares to die. Oh, Lord.